What the eye has not seen, the ear has not heard. Solving the mystery of an ancient saying of wisdom. There is a spiritual saying, an axiom, that's been meaningful to millions of people, defining the spiritual path, what is possible during this life and beyond. A meaningful saying to millions that has spanned many centuries, scriptures, spiritual classics, languages, nations, and several world religions from west to east, east to west. This saying was quoted by the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, but it's been a mystery as to what exactly the source was for his quote. Today we find out the origin of this saying and get to hear various versions of this saying as it appears again and again in so many ancient texts, traveling far and wide, passing through Jewish or rabbinical, also many Christian apocryphal writings. A version of it is even attributed directly to Jesus. And by this, I don't mean just the Gospel of Thomas saying 17, but also in many other sources as well. And I will explore some of those as they appear in various early Christian writings. Other versions of this saying also appear in Egypt, Ethiopia, the Mesopotamian region, and Gnostic, Mandaean, Manichaean scriptures, surahs of the Quran, and a couple of hadiths in Islam. And there's even similar versions to be found in the writings of Kabir, Guru Nanak, the Buddha, and other sources further to the east. This wisdom saying is central to the spiritual journey as it pertains to the spiritual seeing and spiritual hearing capacity of souls and being initiated into the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. The master says, I will give you what the eye has not seen, what the ear has not heard. Solving the mystery of an ancient saying today on this Spiritual Awakening Radio podcast. Later on, I will turn this into a satsang discourse and include related teachings from Kripal Singh and others on spiritual seeing and hearing, that which is inconceivable to the average human mind and what has typically not entered into the heart of man. In his letter to the first Corinthians, the first Corinthians letter, chapter two, the apostle Paul is battling a group of individuals, a faction in Corinth that some scholars have called or dubbed the wisdom Christians, perhaps an early Gnostic group or some sort of mystically inclined contemplative group of Christians that valued wisdom. It's probably not an accident. It's probably no coincidence that Paul is quoting this particular passage in his communication with them. It's probably one of their favorite verses. I'm using the Jerusalem Bible here as a translation of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. This is from his, uh, Paul's letter to the Corinthians. It is a wisdom that none of the rulers of this age have ever known, or they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. We teach what scripture calls the things that no eye has seen and no ear has heard, things beyond the mind of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him." Unquote. There's an interesting footnote at the bottom that says this is either a free combination, a kind of paraphrase done from memory that Paul is making here from memory of Isaiah chapter 64, verse 3, somehow combined with Jeremiah 3.16, or else this is a quote from something called the Apocalypse of Elijah, an interesting book that I will definitely want to talk about on 
podcast today, and uh, in a few minutes, in fact, I will get to the apocalypse of Elijah. What might that be? Blessed are those few translations that are honest, that have truthful and more thorough footnotes that are willing to mention when an apocryphal passage is quoted. Not many translations are like that. They will only attribute things that are found in the canon of Scripture in the Old or New Testaments. Very few are willing to include quotes that are from other sources, like Greek poets or from apocryphal writings. Once upon a time, I was reading the New Testament letter of Jude using the Berkeley translation. And Jude quotes Enoch. And I see at the bottom of the page that it says Jude was quoting from the book of First Enoch, chapter 1. I was blown away by that. Here we find Jude quoting from a book not found anywhere in the, in the Old Testament or the New. Tell me more about this book of First Enoch. And here too we find an honest translation with a footnote willing to disclose that maybe here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 9, something from the apocalypse of Elijah might be the source if it's not some memory quote combining together Isaiah 64 3 with a passage from the book of Jeremiah. This is another translation of 1 Corinthians 2 9, the Tree of Life translation. Things no eye has seen and no ear has heard that have not entered the heart of mankind. These things God has prepared for those who love him. This is from Isaiah 64, 3. Here I'm using, once again, the Jerusalem Bible, hoping for, a, as, as close as we can, get to a word-for-word translation that might possibly match the Jerusalem Bible translation of 1 Corinthians 2, 9. Isaiah 64, 3. No ear has heard, no eye has seen, any God but you act like this. For those who trust him. Not exactly a word-for-word translation, is it? It doesn't completely correspond to 1 Corinthians 2.9, does it? It seems like an early draft, an earlier prototype that maybe, maybe inspired someone to create a, a longer saying of wisdom based on Isaiah 64, 3, developing it a bit further, and then someone else quotes it, quotes a a more developed version of this saying later on, like maybe the Apocalypse of Elijah or some other Jewish apocryphal source. This is Isaiah 64, 3, using a new English translation of the Septuagint, the Greek translation based on the Hebrew scriptures plus Apocrypha made in Alexandria, Egypt long ago. From ages past we have not heard nor have our eyes seen any God besides you and your works which you will do to those who wait for mercy. Unquote. Coming from the Septuagint again it doesn't quite sound like 1 Corinthians 2.9 does it? Not quite. It's got an echo of it. It's, a, it's got a proto eye has not seen, ear has not heard kind of feel to it. But it sounds like something much earlier. Of course, Isaiah was much earlier. I'm picking up a copy of something called The Books of Elijah, Parts 1 and 2, Collected and Translated, part of the Texts and Translations series, Volume 18, Pseudopographa Series 8, published by the Society of Biblical Literature, which has all of these amazing volumes, a tremendous uh, treasure trove of wisdom, quoting all of these writings from early church fathers, early Christian writings, apocryphal writings from Latin and Greek and Ethiopic and Hebrew and 
Aramaic and Syriac, and I'm sure I've left a few languages out, ah, Coptic, <laughs> you know, an amazing scholarly compilation of resources. I want to start, I want to read a passage not about what the Apostle Paul quotes in, for sources in 1 Corinthians, but that the author of Ephesians, the book of Ephesians quoted from in that particular book. As I mentioned earlier, the book of First Enoch is quoted by Jude. And we have this footnote from the Jerusalem Bible that says that maybe Paul was quoting from the Apocalypse of Elijah in 1 Corinthians 2.9. This is interesting. In his letter, this is from an early Christian author, in the letter to the Ephesians, there are six divine testimonies, one from the book of Genesis, the fifth in order, one from Deuteronomy, the sixth in order, one from Psalm 4, the third in order, one from Psalm 67, second in order, one from the prophet Isaiah, the first in order, and one from the Apocryphon of Jeremiah, the fourth in order. That's translated from an ancient Greek text. All of those are from the Hebrew scriptures, except for something called the Apocryphon of Jeremiah, quoted in the book of Ephesians. That's an apocryphal writing not found in the Old Testament or the New, but an extra-canonical text, as they call them, or apocryphal writing. From this same book, the books of Elijah, parts 1 and 2, a list of quotations made by the Apostle Paul in his first epistle or letter to the Corinthians. What Paul is quoting in 1 Corinthians according to this ancient Christian author, and this is translated from either Latin or it looks more like Greek. In the first epistle to the Corinthians, there are 17 quotations, two from Genesis, the 8th and 16th in order. In the epistle, one from Exodus, the 10th in order, two from Deuteronomy, the 7th and 9th in order, one from Kings, the same also from Jeremiah, the prophet, the 2nd in order, one from Psalm 23, the 11th in order. One from Psalm 93, the 6th in order. One from the book of Job, the 5th in order. One from Hosea the prophet, the 7th, or rather the 17th in order. Three from Isaiah, the 1st, 4th, and 13th in order. One from the gospel to Matthew, the 12th in order. One from the apocryphon of Elijah, the 3rd in order. And then it mentions two Greek poets being quoted as well. According to this ancient Christian author writing in Greek, speaking of the sources that Paul quotes in the book of 1 Corinthians, and there it is again, this apocalypse of Elijah. Origin of Alexander also is quoted in this same book. And other sources, too. Many cite Origin of Alexandria regarding 1 Corinthians 2.9. The Apostle Paul, this is quoting Origin of Alexandria. The Apostle Paul quotes certain apocryphal writings, such as that passage, what the eye did not see, nor ear hear. For this is found in no canonical book, it is found in the Apocrypha of Elijah the prophet, unquote. Said Origen of Alexandria, early church father, famous name, famous author. This book also quotes several other early church fathers and, and early Christian sources, all attributing the mystery passage quoted by Paul in 1 Corinthians 2.9 
as being a quote from a book called the, once again, Apocalypse of Elijah, a Jewish apocryphal scripture. One of those early Christian writers says that this is from the Apocrypha of Elijah, the prophet. What Paul was apparently quoting in 1 Corinthians 2.9 was from a now lost edition of the Apocalypse of Elijah, according to the same book, that once upon a time was very popular with Jews and Christians, known during the early centuries AD, but is now a lost book. Now, there are several other writings attributed to Elijah, the prophet, but apparently this particular one containing the quote about what the eye has not seen and the ear has not heard is a lost book, no longer with us. But the quote itself is preserved in other writings. Writing about 50 years after Paul and his letter to the Corinthians, the first letter to the Corinthians, is a text known as 1st Clement. 1st Clement chapter 34 verse 8 says something very similar to the Paul quote. It may be the closest, in fact, uh, the closest surviving passage that most resembles the apocalypse of Elijah. Though it can also be said that dozens of parallel passages also appear in other Jewish apocryphal and various rabbinical writings as well. It's always been a popular saying and turns up again and again in various writings. And we find it here in 1 Clement 34, verse 8. Here I'm using the J.B. Lightfoot translation. For he, or God, says, Eye has not seen, and ear has not heard, and it has not entered into the heart of man what great things he has prepared for them that patiently await him. Unquote. So it's pretty close to what the Apostle Paul was quoting. Not exact. None of these are exactly the same. They're, out of all of these versions, none are exactly the same. We're dealing with so many different manuscripts and languages and people. It's not ever an exact match in any of the cases. But that's pretty close. And I think is quite close to the lost Apocalypse of Elijah. If we had a copy of that back again, it probably would sound a lot like the quote in 1st Clement 34, 8. This is that same passage from 1st Clement 34, 8 using the Charles Hooley translation. For he or God says, eye has not seen and ear has not heard, neither has there entered into the heart of man what things he has prepared for them that wait for him. What the eye has not seen, the ear has not heard, solving the mystery of an ancient saying. The meaning of this saying on mystical and spiritual levels. This is a similar sounding passage that sheds light on the meaning of this saying that we're focused on today. This passage from the Acts of Peter, another New Testament apocryphal writing, provides a great description of meditation practice. Give ear, withdraw your souls from all that appears but is not truly real. Close these eyes of yours, close your ears, withdraw from actions that are not outwardly seen and you shall know the reality of Christ and the whole secret of your salvation. That's a quote from the Acts of Peter, the same book that talks about the Apostle Peter being crucified upside down, 
same book, rather influential in that regard, but very few know of this more Upanishadic spiritual passage about seeing reality, you know, close your eyes and see on a spiritual level. This is the passage I'm most intrigued by in the Acts of Peter. And I found something quite similar to this in another early Christian writing called The Testament of Our Lord, which is translated into English from the Syriac. I will keep some of the surrounding context, but as you'll uh, end up uh, uh, noticing at the end, the part that resembles the saying from the Acts of Peter, once again, suggesting that this saying that's attributed to Peter in the Acts of Peter might be attributed to other people too. It's a, a kind of popular saying of wisdom floating around in early Christianity. In this particular quote, it's not attributed to Peter, but just is uh, just a standalone saying of wisdom once upon a time quoted in early Christian writings. He was crucified for us, and his cross is our life, our strength, our salvation, for it is a hidden mystery, the ineffable joy, and through it the whole nature of mankind, always bearing it, is made inseparable from God. For it is the virtue benign and inseparable from God that cannot be spoken by these lips and that was hidden from the beginning, but now the mystery which is revealed, which is for the faithful shall be not as it seems to be but as it is this cross which in which we boast so that we may be glorified and the bearers whereof the faithful and perfect separate their souls from everything that can be felt from everything that is seen and from a thing which is not true by this we ask for yourselves, O you, make deaf your visible ears, make blind your bodily eyes, so that you may know the will of Christ and all the mystery of your salvation. So very similar to the Acts of Peter quote, close your eyes and see, know the reality, know the mystery. So once again, this saying is associated with early Christian spirituality, but it's not a saying attributed to Christ here, or Peter, or anyone in particular, but it turns up in this text. And from this same testament of our Lord, translated into English from the Syriac, we also find a section attributed directly to Jesus that is definitely of interest here. Let the shepherd know the mysteries of all nature. After I have prayed to the Father, as you know and see, I am taken up, says Jesus. Therefore, it is right that the shepherd should speak the teaching of the initiation into the mysteries so that they may know of whom in the holy things they are partaking and what memorial they are making through the Eucharist, the communion. And at the end, after this, let him say thus, and then we also have taken refuge in him and have learnt that it is in him alone to give. Let us beg from him those things which he, God, said that he would give us, which eye has not seen and ear has not heard, and which have not entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him, unquote, as Moses and some of the saints have said. And then we have hoped in him. Let us give to him praise, and to him be glory and might forever and ever. Amen. This is a prayer attributed to Jesus in the Testament of our Lord, translated into English from the Syriac, and in this prayer, Jesus is quoting this eye has not seen, ear has not heard saying, and attributes it, he attributes it to Moses and 
psalm of the saints, unquote. Now, we don't know of a Moses book, certainly not anywhere present in the Hebrew Bible, where this saying turns up. So, this is alluding to some apocryphal book of Moses, or Assumption of Moses, or Ascension of Moses, or Apocryphon of Moses that is lost to history. And the reference to the saints, or other others before him that also said this, that could be Isaiah, Jeremiah, who knows, right? Or Elijah once again, right? So this is not a saying, the eye has not seen saying is not attributed here to Jesus, but Jesus is quoting it and attributing it to saying that there are multiple sources that have said this, Moses and some of the saints, plural. So who knows? Isaiah, hello, Jeremiah, the ascension of, uh, or apocalypse of Elijah, or, you know, who knows? But these would all be apocryphal texts of late Judaism being alluded to here. He, God, said that he would give us which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered into the heart of man, the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Jesus quoting Moses and other saints, who knows, prophets, Jewish scriptures, pseudopographical, apocryphal Jewish texts of the past, who knows? And that's found in Testament of Our Lord, translated into English from the Syriac, and includes that other passage, which seems to not be attributed to Peter like it was in the Acts of Peter, but helps to define what they're talking about here, about what the eye can see spiritually and hear spiritually. O oh, you, make deaf your visible ears, make blind your bodily eyes, so that you may know the will of Christ and all the mystery of your salvation. Close your eyes and see, which is what some people mean by meditation. Close your eyes, focus within, in the tranquility of silence or spiritual rest, waiting upon God and gaining some sense of revelation in the stillness. The Gospel of Thomas attributes a saying to Jesus in 17, verse 17 of the Gospel of Thomas. What your own eyes cannot see, your human ears do not hear, your physical hands cannot touch, and what is inconceivable to the human mind, that I will give to you. Saying 17, Gospel of Thomas. The Lynn Bauman translation, known as the Gospel of Thomas, Wisdom of the Twin. Rendering that in a way that I really enjoy uh, and have quoted before on podcasts. Saying 17 of the Gospel of Thomas. Now it's interesting, the, the Syriac Testament of our Lord also has a reference to the hand. And so Thomas, the Thomas version is not the only one to talk about touch being associated, not just seeing and hearing, but touch. It also, uh, it's, in, it's in this testament of the Lord from the Syriac, as well as in saying 17 of the Gospel of Thomas. This saying of Jesus, it's now attributed to Jesus in this particular Gospel, the Gospel of Thomas, which has its origins in the Syriac Mesopotamian region. This to me portrays Jesus as a living spiritual master offering an initiation to his students, imparting to them techniques whereby they may be able to develop spiritual seeing and transcendental hearing in order to explore the kingdom of the heavens, an unseen present tense kingdom of God that's available right now in the living present, not a future hypothetical kingdom 
in the sky in the by and by theorized or made theoretical by prophecy speculation this is a matter of closing your eyes focusing now and knowing a spiritual reality pertaining to the kingdom of the heavens in the here and now what the eye has not seen the ear has not heard various versions of this axiom of wisdom about what the eye has not seen and ear has not heard turn up in many other scriptures as well and some of them are also attributed to Jesus not Jesus quoting a passage from a mystery apocrypha source but actually a saying of Jesus and there is some basis for this to be found in the gospel of Matthew Luke and for those familiar with the hypothetical reconstructed document Q or the source text that both Matthew and Luke and Thomas quoted from sometimes a collection of sayings this is from Matthew 13 16 and 17 how privileged are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear I swear to you many prophets and righteous ones have longed to see what you see and didn't see it and to hear what you hear and didn't hear it so that's a saying of Jesus that is in the in the neighborhood of what the eye has not seen and the ear has not heard uh, that becomes available through the mystery of this spirituality being communicated in early Christianity it's in the neighborhood it's not word-for-word word. Thomas of course saying 17 but it is about seeing spiritually and hearing spiritually and then we find in a book called testament of the Lord in Galilee this saying which is attributed to Jesus his power will be given to them which no eye has seen nor ear heard and they will rejoice in my kingdom so once again like Thomas a version of this saying is directly attributed to Jesus in an early Christian writing no longer Jesus quoting from a lost apocryphon of Moses apocalypse of Elijah or some other apocryphal Jewish text but it's kind of morphed into a saying of Jesus this part of it very similar to saying 17 of the Gospel of Thomas what your own eyes cannot see your human ears do not hear your physical hands cannot touch and what is inconceivable to the human mind that I will give you this is a Manichaean scripture from Central Asia one of the turf and from one of the turf and fragments found translated into English in a book called Gnosis on the Silk Road from a later Manichaean text that I may redeem you from death and annihilation I will give you what you have not seen with the eye nor heard with the ears nor grasped with the hands that's from a Manichaean scripture from Central Asia one of the Turfan fragments I want to grab a copy of this book of apocryphal writings I think there's a third volume of this coming out soon if not already but this is from the first volume of something called New Testament Apocrypha more non canonical scriptures volume 1 the, the Tony Burke compilation there's a volume 1 there's a volume 2 and I believe there's now maybe even a volume 3 this is from a text called the encomnium of John the Baptist it's an early Christian writing one of many more than we all know <laughs> there's a lot of these early Christian writings many of which we've barely even uh, heard of before 
I mean, people were excited when the Nag Hammadi library was discovered in the Gospel of Thomas and Gospel of Judas and and, uh, thought a new day has dawned. But you know, there are hundreds of these things. Gospel of Bartholomew and I mean, there's, there's hundreds, hundreds of them. It's not just a few lost books. It's a whole lost library we're trying to recover here. And this is a book called The Ecomnium of John the Baptist, a kind of book dedicated to the celebration of John the Baptist, the greatest of the prophets, an early Christian writing. And this section here is all attributed to Jesus directly. These are the good things that I have prepared for anyone who remembers my beloved relative John on earth. Blessed are all those who are deemed worthy to inherit these good things, to inherit these good things, which the eye has not seen, nor the ear heard, nor instilled within the human heart. These things God has prepared for those who love him and love John, his friend and relative. There is none who have received the honor he attained in heaven and on earth. So, this is Jesus speaking here in this text in praise of John the Baptist. And included in this is, once again, that passage about what the eye has not seen and the ear has not heard, attributed directly to Jesus in this text which is fascinating to see. Now, this saying also morphs into other directions and uh, can be found elsewhere, too. This is from the Gospel of Judas, one of my favorite passages from the Gospel of Judas. Come, and this is also attributed to Jesus, Come, that I may teach you about the secrets no person has ever seen, for there exists a great and boundless realm whose extent no generation of angels has seen, in which there is a great invisible spirit, which no eye of an angel has ever seen, no thought of the heart has ever comprehended, and it was never called by any name, unquote. Saying of Jesus, found in the Gospel of Judas, it reads a bit different, but there it is again, no eye of an angel has ever seen. Now, it refers to God as nameless here and was never called by any name. In some of the Gnostic texts, the Supreme Being is called the Nameless One. In India, the term for nameless is Anami, and so there are some that refer to the Supreme Being as Anami Parush, or Sat Parush Anami referring to the true supreme being, the unknown father in the highest of realms. And of course, the nameless God has been given many names, east and west. But it's interesting to see the reference to the one never called by any name, which is referring to the exalted state of the supreme being whose name really can't be pronounced by human lips is beyond earthly language and is a formless being beyond space and time, has no form, is beyond what can be seen, beyond what can be heard, beyond light and beyond sound, the transcendent supreme being. This is from the Nag Hammadi Library. Uh, The Prayer of the Apostle Paul, one of the tiny books one in one of the, the codices of Nag Hammadi. Grant what no angel eye has seen and no archon ear has heard and what has not entered into the human heart, which came to be angelic. So there it is once again, part of a prayer actually attributed to the Apostle Paul that sounds kind of different from the Apostle Paul we know. But there it is again, that same saying, kind of a little bit closer to the Judas one, you know, in some Gnostic tradition that includes that saying, no angel eye has seen and no archon ear has heard. Another version of it. 
In the Ethiopian Bible is preserved a Jewish apocryphal text that reminds me in this particular passage of a near-death experience. Ascension of Isaiah from the Ethiopic uh, chapter 11 verse 34 and this angel said to me Isaiah son of Amos I set you free for you have seen what no mortal man has ever seen before you must return to your garments of flesh until your days are completed then you will come up here again unquote it sounds a lot like a near-death experience you know Isaiah you have more to do back on earth in your body your mission isn't complete yet I'm sending you back and uh, you know like a near-death experience now it is interesting that there is a I forget the language if it's Latin or Slavonic there is another version of the ascension of Isaiah which the Cathars of France used in the Middle Ages and in this section of chapter 11 of the ascension of Isaiah in addition to what I just read there is an interpolation added that's not present in the earlier Ethiopic edition which is an exact quote of 1st Corinthians chapter 2 verse 9 I will give you what no eye has seen what no ear has heard I don't of course make use of this as any sort of proof text because obviously someone you know in the Middle Ages or 5th century 6th century uh, at some point actually added that to the ascension of Isaiah what we call an interpolation someone recognized a similar language it reminded this passage from the ascension of Isaiah reminded them of 1st Corinthians 2 9 and they they liked it so much they actually added it to the text and so it's found in the Cathar edition of the ascension of Isaiah which is based on a Latin or Slavonic later translation which I think also includes the word Trinity which I doubt very much that a Jewish apocryphal text from BC times uh, would have as a word I don't think the word Trinity would be used by a Jewish source so that's likely the example of another interpolation added to the text later on and that sometimes happens there are a few other apocryphal writings that were originally Jewish that Christians have added you know first Corinthians 2 9 to but of course that's not a proof of an ancient source that means that somebody in the third or fourth or fifth century AD very much acquainted with the first Corinthians decided to add that verse that particular verse to a, an older text that can happen the 10th century Persian Sufi master Jalani quotes an interesting passage from the Quran this is from one of the surahs of the Quran I have prepared for my righteous servants that which no eye has ever seen of which no ear has ever heard and of which has never occurred to the heart of man that appears that quote that surah from the Quran appears in a spiritual classic of Sufism called concerning the affirmation of divine oneness and so here the quote is in is attributed to God I have prepared for my righteous servants this is prepare you know this is very much sound it very much sounds like uh, the Clement version from uh, earlier in the podcast first uh, Clement 34 8 for God says not Allah says but for God says eye has not seen and ear has not heard so it sounds a little bit like that uh, but also a little bit like first Corinthians 2 9 right a, a, a bit similar to that or close to that there are also a few hadiths in Islam that preserve versions of this saying about what the eye has not seen and the ear has not heard and that likely are derived from some Jewish or Christian apocryphal source Allah said I have prepared for my righteous slaves what no eye has seen what no eye has ever seen 
nor an ear has ever heard, nor a human heart can ever think of." Unquote. Very similar to the first Clement quote, which I believe is the closest that resembles the lost ascension of Isaiah passage that Paul quoted in 1 Corinthians. For God says, not Allah in this case, but for God says, eye has not seen and ear has not heard and it has not entered into the heart of man what great things he has prepared for them that patiently await him. Or the other translation, the Huli translation, for God or says, for God says, eye has not seen and ear has not heard, neither has there entered into the heart of man what things he has prepared for them that wait for him. From a prayer found in the Mandaean scriptures of Iraq, the Mandaeans are a proto Gnostic kind of group, several uh, branches removed from, you know, it's a branch of a branch of a branch of a branch of a Transjordan baptismal sect associated with John the Baptist called the Nazareans. And so maybe, uh, as with that Christian text in praise of John the Baptist that includes this uh, passage we're focused on today, uh, maybe this saying was also popular with the John the Baptist group. You know, the Lord's Prayer is based on a prayer used in the John the Baptist sect that Jesus shared. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and so on. So maybe this saying about what the eye has not seen and the ear has not heard was once upon a time popular in the John the Baptist sect. That would make a lot of sense, too. They were familiar with apocryphal writings as well as the book of Isaiah. So it's likely or quite plausible it could have been a popular saying with them, too. In any case, it turns up in this Mandaean text. The Mandaeans moved from the Transjordan area to eventually... I think they spent some time in Edessa, Syria. But they ended up in the marsh regions of Iraq, as well as near rivers that resembled the Jordan River, uh, the Tigris and the Euphrates. They relocated to Iraq and have a lot of interesting scriptures, which I have uh, actually gotten hold of. They speak Aramaic too, by the way, a, a dialect of the Aramaic language. This is from the... Mandaean scriptures, or Mandaean scriptures, to be more precise in the pronunciation of their name. Thou hast showed us that which the eye has not seen, and caused us to hear that which the human ear has not heard. Thou hast freed us from death, and united us with life, released us from darkness, and united us with light. Thou hast shown us that which the eye has not seen, and caused us to hear that which the human ear has not heard. Canonical Prayer Book of the Mandaeans. E. S. Drower, Ethel, uh, Ethel S. Drower, translator. The mystery of this saying, what the eye has not seen, the ear has not heard. This saying traveled further to the east, not just Iraq, the marshland region of Iraq, and a bit into Iran. There are some Mandaeans that also live in uh, Iran. But further to the east, there is a, a similar kind of saying, and I turn this into a satsang discourse now. What is the whole point of this? Human beings becoming initiated into the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, closing their eyes, their physical eye, 
eyes in order to see spiritually, to focus in the silence, to hear spiritually, to become born from above, to explore the kingdom of the heavens. The divine eye, according to the Buddha, with the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, a disciple surveys a thousand worlds. Just as a man with good sight, when he has ascended to the upper palace chamber, might survey a thousand wheel rims, so too with the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, a disciple surveys a thousand worlds. The divine ear, according to the Buddha, I have proclaimed to my disciples a way whereby with the divine ear element, which is purified and surpasses the human, they hear both kinds of sounds, the divine and the human, those that are far as well as near. Just as a vigorous trumpeter might make himself heard without difficulty in the four quarters or directions, so too I have proclaimed to my disciples a way whereby with the divine ear element, far as well as near, thereby many disciples of mine abide, having reached the consummation and perfection of direct knowledge. The Buddha, the middle length discourses of the Buddha. Direct knowledge in Greek is translated as gnosis, referring not to intellectual knowledge, but spiritual perception, spiritually perceiving. Guru Nanak once said, we speak without tongues, we see without eyes, we hear without ears, we walk without feet, and we work without hands. It almost sounds like that Beatles tune, Inner Light. You know, just seeing without seeing, traveling without traveling, you know, kind of interesting lyrics there. Guru Angad of the Sikhs, one of the Sikh gurus, also from the Adi Granth, Sri Guru Granth Sahib, the Sikh scriptures. Guru Angad once said, seeing without eyes, hearing without ears, walking without feet, working without hands, uttering his name without tongue and dying while living is accepting his will. Dying while living, death before dying, the St. Paul version is I die daily. These are mystical descriptions of transcending the body while alive, catching a glimpse of the heavens now, an inkling of the kingdom of the heavens through another kind of sight, another kind of hearing like that uh, George Harrison inner light tune, which was actually paraphrasing a translation of the Tao Te Ching of Lao Tzu, you know, about doing without doing and, you know, seeing differently and, and traveling in a different sort of way, you might, you might say. Saint Kabir, also from the East. May I see you with my eyes, hear your sound with my own ears. Speak your name in my own words, O Lord. Rest your flower-like feet on my heart. Songs of Kabir from the Adi Granth, the Sikh scriptures. May I see you with my eyes, hear your sound with my own ears. Speak your name in my own words, O Lord. Rest your flower-like feet on my heart. Kabir also said, and this is from the Rabindranath Tagore translation called Songs of Kabir. It is the mercy of my Satguru, or true teacher, that he has made me to know the unknown. I have learned from him how to walk without feet to see without eyes, to hear without ears, to drink without mouth, to fly without wings. I have brought my love and my meditation into the land where there is no sun and moon, nor day and night. Without eating I have tasted the sweetness of nectar, and without water I have quenched my thirst. 
Where there is the response of delight, there is the fullness of joy. Before whom can that joy be uttered? Kabir says, the master is great beyond words, and great is the good fortune of the disciple. Listen within, day and night. You will hear blissful inner sounds. Within everyone reverberates the Shabbat, the sound current, about which no one knows. The Brahmanan, the cosmos of the inner planes, is represented in the temple of the human body in every respect. Says Sant Tulsi Sahib of Hathras, Open your inner eyes and the saint, the saint, will show it to you. The path leading to God is within your heart. Enter into the Ajna Chakra, the third eye, and you will find your beloved. God is found not in the man-made temple or Kaaba, holy place, but in the natural holy place or Kaaba within your own heart or self. Turn your attention within. You should listen attentively to the reverberating divine sound. The celestial sound is coming to take you back to the source. That's a quote from Swami Sant Seviji Maharaj, disciple of Maharishi Mehi Paramahans, in one of the Sant Tulsi Sahib lineages. The temple of the human body is the place to enter into to access this other kind of seeing and other kind of hearing and other kind of ascension. God is perceivable only through the soul, but our individual soul has become surrounded or covered by several sheaths or subtle bodies astral body, causal body, etc. So long as it remains in the captivity of these various subtle bodies and the physical body, it will be under the awareness or knowledge of these bodies and organs only, will be under illusory knowledge only, and will not be able to realize God. In order to know him, the jiva atma or soul, the individual soul, shall have to liberate itself from these bondages. The one who is able to liberate himself from the body and subtle bodies is able to lift himself beyond the universe also. That's a paragraph from a satsang discourse of Param Puja Shahai Swamiji also from the Maharishi Mehi branch of Sant Mat. Kripal Singh, readings from Spiritual Elixir, his letters to initiates. Mind has to be stilled. Mind has to be stilled. Eyes have to be closed from all external views. And the ears likewise from all outer sounds. The soul currents of the body have to be withdrawn and collected at one center, the seat of the soul, in the body, the third eye center. And this is done according to the instructions given at the time of initiation. Just a brief outline of the meditation practice of Santmat as it's come down to us from ancient times. An initiation into the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven as done by the living master. In Sant Mat meditation, there are three basic inner practices, Simran or Manas Jap, the repetition, the mental, for the most part, mental repetition of sacred names of God. Two, Dhyan, the yoga of the inner light, seeing with the third eye. That which sees the dark veil within without the help of your physical eyes is the inner eye, says Kripal Singh. And the third practice, bhajan, also known as surit shabad yoga, spiritual hearing, 
the yoga of sound, the yoga of hearing the inner sound current, meditation on the audible life stream, the logos, the music of the spheres. Who else is Christ but the sound of God? As it says in the Acts of John, who else is Christ but the sound of God? The Logos, the music of the spheres that set creation in motion long ago. And this same reverberation is followed by the soul back again, back to the source, back to the beginning. In the beginning was the word, the Logos. Back to it we go by way of Surit Shabad Yoga. Kripal Singh, Sant Kripal Singh's spiritual elixir. The repetition of the charged names given to the disciple as a weapon against all dangers is given uh, to the disciple as a weapon against all dangers. It acts also as a password to all spiritual planes, gives strength and sustenance to the body and mind during trouble and affliction, and brings the soul nearer the master. It is instrumental in achieving concentration and imparts many other diverse powers. The five charged names given by a true master are electrified words. The light within should be penetrated while fixing your gaze intently in its center when it will grow stronger and burst to give you further way up. Similarly, the sound current as coming from the right side should be listened to with rapt attention. The scattering of mind will be subdued. If you please, learn to devote yourself to single-minded attention for looking and listening within. On the path of the masters, attention is a means of transportation. What you focus on, you become, you go toward. You focus your attention. Attention is such a powerful word. It's actually another name for the soul itself. The soul, a surat, the, the surat, S-U-R-A-T, surat. The attention faculty of the soul. The soul's ability to hear. The soul's ability to see. The soul's ability to discern and ascend, to go above. Surat, narat, bhairat. Seeing, hearing, discerning along the way. Kripal Singh, the light within should be penetrated while fixing your gaze intently in its center when it will grow stronger and burst to give you further way up. Kripal Singh, the inner light does not come or go, it's always there within. It appears only when we are attuned and concentrated and disappears as soon as there is the slightest dispersion. The light will not vanish if you just keep your inner gaze constantly fixed." Unquote. Another passage from the book Spiritual Elixir, which is a free online book, which you can request. Email me at james at spiritualawakeningradio.com. I'll send you a link to Spiritual Elixir. It has a great chapter on meditation practice, which is really quite amazing. Focusing Attention within. Darkness is no longer dark. There is sound beyond the silence. There is a music of the spheres and the logos reverberating in creation. Sant Kripal Singh, once you discover this light and learn to live by it, your whole existence will be changed. Love will permeate your very being and it will burst forth from the very pores of your body transmuting all dross into sterling gold spiritual elixir one more thought about the earlier passage about uh, concentrating the light and sound are always there it's we who come and go we concentrate the light appears to appear and then the light disappears when we break off our meditation and go about our day the sound may manifest as we focus in the silence of meditation 
Be still and know that I am God. We hear it in the silence. The sound appears and then the sound disappears as we break our attention and go about our day. So it creates a kind of illusion of the appearance of the sound, the manifestation of the light. But the light and sound are within everyone, according to the saints. The light and sound are within everyone. In the true terminology of the saints or masters, a blind man is defined not as one who has no eyes in his head, but as one whose inner eye is closed. Those who do not see the light of God are all, excuse me, blind. When they come to a master and he gives them a sitting, the inner eye is opened and they see the light of God. When they return, they are men with the inner eye opened. Similarly, before going to a master, a man is deaf. When the master gives him a sitting, he begins to hear the music of the spheres and he becomes awake. Kripal Singh from the booklet, God Power, Christ Power, Master Power on the initiation into the mysteries. The master said, what your own eyes cannot see, your human ears do not hear, your physical hands cannot touch, and what is inconceivable to the human mind, that I will give to you. Gospel of Thomas, saying 17. Thanks for joining me today for this podcast, exploring the mystery of an ancient axiom of wisdom flowing through scriptures and spiritual classics and schools of spirituality east and west what the eye has not seen the ear has not heard solving the mystery of an ancient saying <laughs>